Welcome back to our part two of our three-part series of critical findings in echocardiography. In this next case, I'm going to show you an echocardiogram of an 11-year-old boy who was diagnosed with tuberous sclerosis. He came to the hospital complaining of cough, dyspnea, sweating, and weight loss. And here is his echocardiogram. Right away, you can tell that there's something in the left ventricle. Is it a thrombus? Is it a vegetation? Is it just a big papillary muscle? What's the one thing that we're concerned with here? If you watched our first video, you should already know that this is not a thrombus nor a vegetation. Based on this patient's history, that kind of gives you an idea of what this might be. Tumors associated with tuberous sclerosis are rhabdomyomas. This is the most common benign cardiac tumor in children. Findings like these don't require you to run out of the patient's room and call a reading physician right away. You can go ahead and finish your protocol in this exam. Once you're done, then go call a reading physician. The main concerns of cardiac tumors like this are embolization and obstructions. It's highly unlikely that this tumor here is going to break loose and embolize somewhere else. What we're worried about is something else is growing on there, like a vegetation or a thrombus. Now bits and pieces of the tumor or mass can break loose and go to the brain or it could embolize somewhere else. 2D characteristics include multiple hyperechoic homogeneous structures with a pedunculated look that will protrude into the left or right ventricle. So in this echo, you can appreciate how this tumor is growing on the inferior lateral side of the left ventricle, protruding into the left ventricle. Here we can see a tumor that's growing inside the left atrium. This is called the myxoma. This is the most common cardiac benign tumor in adults. These tumors are commonly found on the fossil valves on the left atrial side. However, they can be found in the right atrium as well. Now, let's look at common cardiac tumors grown on heart valves. This type of tumor is called the papillary fibroelastoma which is the second most common benign tumor found in adults. These type of tumors are more commonly found on the left side of the heart, the most common being the aortic valve. They have been known to grow on mitral valves as well. So if you were to see this for the very first time and you didn't know what it was, how would you know it's not a vegetation or a thrombus? I think we can rule out a thrombus solely based on a thrombus more often than not will grow in areas of low blood flow. As you can see here, the flow through the aortic valve is pretty steady. How do you know it's not a vegetation? If you were to find a vegetation this big, you are more likely to find valvular destruction. But the valve here looks intact. Plus, patients like this will have or have had flu-like symptoms. These include fevers, chills, and night sweats. If your patient's feeling well, and it looks like there's no valvular destruction, chances are it's probably something else. Why are we concerned about this? What's the main thing we're worried about? Probably embolization. That thing could break loose at any second and embolize somewhere else in the body. In a case like this, when it looks like something is minutes away from embolizing, I would call the reading physician and let them know what you found and ask them what the next step is. Moving along, here we have a cardiac fibroma. This is the second most common benign cardiac tumor found in children. They typically like to grow on the left ventricular lateral wall or the interventricular septum. Now this isn't a critical finding. I just wanted to show you a couple different types of tumors that you might run into either in peds or adult echocardiography. So far, we've only looked at benign tumors. Let's take a look at something that's more metastatic. This type of tumor is called a renal cell carcinoma. This tumor will typically invade the renal vein, in which then it'll extend to the IVC and then into the right atrium. The main problem with these types of tumors is that the life expectancy of the patient is very low. This echo here is demonstrating an angiosarcoma on the right side. These types of tumors like to grow close to the inferior vena cava. They will grow in a large, broad base manner. So what's the difference between a benign and a malignant cardiac tumor? Benign tumors are typically round or oval in shape and will have a clear and smooth texture. Whereas malignant tumors will have a heterogeneous ultrasound feature with irregular or distorted shapes. The texture of these tumors will have a rough or unclear look to it. Remember, the gold standard of identifying cardiac tumors is performing a biopsy for lab analysis. Now, before we move on, I want to test your knowledge based on everything you've learned so far and tell me whether or not this is a critical finding or not. If you haven't seen part one, feel free to pause this, go back and watch part one, then come back so you don't miss a step. This is an ultrasound of a patient who came to the ER complaining of chest pain. What is that hyperechoic structure inside the aortic arch? This is something you have to get right. You should spend plenty of time imaging structures like this so that you will know for sure you know what you're looking at. So you gotta change your angle, change views. 
This is something you have to rule in or rule out before you end the study. You definitely don't want to play the guessing game with someone's life. This is a great opportunity to utilize the settings you have on the ultrasound machine. For example, lower the gains, adjust the TGCs, change the depth, throw some color Doppler on there. Don't forget to talk to the patient as well. Ask them questions about their symptoms, why they're here, why they're getting in the exam. Sometimes a little information from the patient will go a long way. What's your final decision? Does this patient have a dissection or is it an artifact? The final verdict? This is an artifact. If it was a dissection, you would see a membrane coming across and flapping in and out after each contraction. If you knew this was an artifact from the get-go, kudos to you. Now, if you didn't know it was an artifact, that's okay. The only way to become an expert is to have a lot of experience, and that comes with time. So don't beat yourself up. You still have plenty of time to grow and mature in this field. Go back and watch part one, and maybe that will help you in the future become more knowledgeable in determining whether or not something is an artifact or something that deserves recognition. There are a couple of different artifacts that can be identified in this aortic arch. The first is called the reverberation artifact. When a pulse is emitted from a transducer, it will reflect off the surface of a structure and return back to the transducer. Reverberation occurs when a portion of that pulse returns back to the transducer, while another portion of that pulse is reflected back to that structure and then back to the transducer, essentially making a second round trip. Because the ultrasound machine will assume that one pulse will make one round trip, this will cause the artifact to be displaced twice as deep as the original structure. The other artifact demonstrated here is called the side lobe. When ultrasound is emitted into the body, most of its energy is concentrated in the middle. However, there are small amounts of energy that are dispersed to each side. These reflectors will be interpreted as coming from the central beam and will form what will look like a flap in the aorta. These reflectors will merge and overlap, producing a linear arc-like structure in the aortic arch. There are three types of aortic dissections, in which the first two types are categorized as a Stanford A, and the third type is categorized as a Stanford B. Type one of Stanford A is called the DeBakey one. This occurs when the dissection originates from the ascending aorta and extends into the transverse aortic arch through the descending aorta down into the abdominal aorta. The second type of Stanford A is called the DeBakey II. This type is only confined within the ascending aorta. Extends only from the ascending aorta to the top of the aortic arch. The third type in the Stanford B category is called the DeBakey III. This is the least dangerous of the three dissections. This will extend distal to the left subclavian artery and will propagate down to the abdominal aorta. Remember that type A is more common than type B. So this is an example without a dissection, and here's one with a dissection. You can really appreciate in the transverse view that the flow is not separated by the intimal flap in the normal aortic arch. However, the one with the dissection, you can see that the flow is separated. This next case is a patient who came to the hospital complaining of palpitations and dyspnea on exertion. This is his echo. Now you don't have to be an expert to know right away that something is wrong here. Anybody want to guess what the abnormal structure here measures in diameter? Well, the sonographer measured 13 centimeters. Oh, and one more thing. Do you think this is a dissection? The answer is no. This is just a side lobe artifact. This abnormality is called an aneurysm of the aortic arch. Findings like this should be reported to the reading physician as soon as possible. Now there are three types of aneurysms. The first one is called a fusiform. This is the most common type. This type of aneurysm will bulge out on all sides of a vessel. The second type is called a saccular. These aneurysms will kind of bulge out on one side of a vessel. Now both saccular and fusiform aneurysms are called true aneurysms. The third type is called a pseudoaneurysm. Pseudoaneurysms are called false aneurysms. This type of aneurysm also bulges out on one side. Now the difference between a saccular and a pseudoaneurysm is that a pseudoaneurysm will have a neck at the base, whereas a saccular aneurysm will kind of bulge out on one side and will be wide at the base. So if you can picture my left hand as the side of a vessel, you have a fusiform will kind of bulge out like this. So it's wider here at the base. Whereas a pseudoaneurysm will look like this. So you'll have the side of the vessel here, aneurysm sticking out like this with the neck at the base right here. If you're able to pulse the neck, you'll see a to and fro waveform. As opposed to saccular, 
you'll see more of an eddy current color flow. A true arterial aneurysm will affect all three layers of the artery. These include the inner layer, the tunica intima, the middle layer, the tunica media, and the outer layer, the tunica adventitia. A false arterial aneurysm will only affect two layers. This includes the middle, the tunica media, and the outer layer, the tunica adventitia. The most common cause of a true arterial aneurysm is due to hypertension and atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is hardening of the vessel that will eventually weaken and damage the arterial wall, making the vessel expand and bulge. The most common cause of an arterial false pseudoaneurysm is due to an arterial puncture through catheterization or some kind of angiographic procedure, but it can also be caused by trauma or a graft blowout. A true cardiac aneurysm will affect all three layers of the heart. This includes the inner layer, the endocardium, the middle layer, the myocardium, and the outer layer, the epicardium. A false cardiac aneurysm will only affect two layers. These include the myocardium, the middle layer, and the outer layer, the epicardium. The most common cause of a true and a false cardiac aneurysm is due to a myocardial infarction. Now there are two syndromes you have to know for your boards that cause aortic aneurysms. These are both connective tissue disorders. The first one's called Marfan syndrome, and the second is called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Aortic aneurysms can also be caused by traumatic chest injury. Make sure when you're measuring the aortic root and the ascending aorta that you're measuring leading edge to leading edge. And make sure you're measuring at end diastole. If you're scanning someone with Marfan syndrome and you measure 4.5 centimeters on the ascending aorta, this has to be reported as soon as possible because this is the cutoff in which Marfan syndrome patients have to have corrective surgery. If they don't have Marfan syndrome, and you measure 4.5 centimeters, this is not a pressing issue. If you measure five centimeters or above, then you definitely have to report these findings to the reading physician as soon as possible. Marfan syndrome or not. I'm Jim with UltrasoundBoardReview.com. Stay tuned for part three of our three-part series of critical findings in echocardiography.